Hi everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all our participants who are joining in from different parts of the globe. Welcome to our second keynote lecture. My name is Redan Resho and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at the Informal Urbanism Research Hub in the University of Melbourne. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where this event is being hosted, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today's keynote lecture is part of INFIRST International Webinar Series titled Informal Formal Urbanism, The Challenges of Co-Production. I am pleased to be welcoming Professor Alison Brown, who is a global leader in the study of urban informal economies. Alison is a professor at the School of Geography and Planning at Cardiff University, where she is also the course director for the Master of Science in International Planning and Development. She has written and edited books and journal articles on informal economic activities in different cities around the globe. Alison is a chartered planner with extensive professional experience in global north and global south context in both consultancy and academic research. Her areas of expertise include international planning practice, urban informal economies, social inclusion, public space, and the right to the city. Alison is also a member of the steering committee of UN Habitat's World Urban Campaign. She is a planning advisor to the influential global policy advocacy group, UIGO, or Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing on their Inclusive Cities project. Her lecture today is titled, The Informal Economy in Urban Crisis Recovery. Alison will speak for uh, 40 minutes and then we will open the floor to questions. So participants, please use the uh, Zoom Q&A function to share your questions with me. And uh, with that, Alison, I now turn it over to you. Fantastic, Red, and thank you very much for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's quite early in the morning for me here. And um, it's just such a pleasure to be part of this series and to join this conference on informal formal urbanization the challenges of co-production. So I'm an urbanist and I started researching the informal economy more than 20 years ago and I've actually been really privileged to work with informal workers, with academic collaborators in, in over 20 different countries during that period. And I'm going to talk about the challenges of recovery after crisis, particularly through the lens of the informal economy but it's exciting potential if we recognize that potential and look at the responses in fragile urban environments. So I'm just going to go through the process of sharing my screen and sharing a PowerPoint, if you'll just give me a moment. So this is a photograph of a refugee camp in Hargeza in Somaliland. Refugees in, in Hargeza have been coming from different parts of Somaliland for many years. Some of them were displaced more than 20 years ago by the legacy of civil war and fighting in the countryside. More recently, there's been an influx as a result of the drought in 2017 and 2018. But you can see that even here in such unpromising situations, commerce and enterprise thrives. And I guess you can get almost anything you want in the Tawakal shop. So today I'm going to talk about co-production in economic recovery and look at the role of the urban informal economy in post-conflict economic recovery. I'm drawing on comparative research that we've done and, and work by some of my PhDs in Africa, Asia, the Middle East and Latin America. And we draw on recent uh, projects 
and current projects on the role of the urban informal economy in post-conflict cities, refugee economies, and a current project on protracted displacement. So I'm going to talk about five different aspects. First of all, look at the characteristics of the informal economy, which make it particularly relevant to conflict recovery. Then look at how the informal economy responds through crisis, through various case studies. Then look at the idea of refugee or displacement economies. And then finally, look at a case study of economies in Addis Ababa before I move to the conclusion. Our work in Cardiff has been done through the Informal Economy Research Observatory, which is a collaboration of researchers who've worked in many different parts of the world. And you can look at some of our projects here. And I think my interest in post-conflict recovery was sparked by a small project that I did in Cairo and Tunis after the Arab Spring Revolutions in 2012. And you will remember that sadly, it was the death of a street vendor in Tunisia uh, in 2011, the end of 2010, which was the trigger for the Arab revolutions and the claim for democracy. Um, and as you can see, the, the, this, uh, this, um, this painting is one of the wall paintings that was happening in Tahrir Square in 2012 um, and, and says we're not there yet, we're, we're, our claim isn't, isn't fully fulfilled. But even during these mass occupations, uh, you will see what a, what a degree of organisation and how much enterprise took place. This is a photograph of Tahrir Square taken in 2011 from the BBC website. And you can see that uh, there's a large praying area for, for people praying in, in the foreground, that there are campsites, but particularly there are people selling flags and souvenirs and toilets, there are creches and pharmacies. So people self-organize, they find a way to survive through crisis. And I think this is a good example. So let me talk first about the informal economy and its characteristics. What do we mean by the informal economy? So we talk first of all about organizations. And if you look at the top darker green row in, in this diagram, that uh, informal employment occurs both in uh, informal and unregistered organizations, enterprises which aren't registered according to local uh, legislation, but are nevertheless um, uh, still undertaking socially acceptable, uh, socially acceptable uh, activities. And we distinguish between the informal and criminal activities. I'm talking about the, 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 um, the first category here. Uh, but down the left hand side, you also see the different types of labor, which can be formal or informal and formal labor is, is that which has a contract and social protection informal that without. The informal economy includes the, the pale green, the slightly darker of the pale green uh, squares. So all three elements, the informal sector of informal enterprises and businesses, um, formal employment in the informal sector, that's rare, but it does happen, but particularly informal employment in formal organizations and worldwide, we have seen an increasing casualization of labor. So the informal economy is global. We tend to see it as you know, the work of a street uh, vendor or street sweeper. But in fact, the new figures in 2018 by the ILO, the International Labour Organization, suggests that it's 86% of, of all the workforce in Africa, 68% in Asia and the Pacific, 69% in the Arab states, 40% in the Americas. And that includes uh, uh, North America and Canada. And in Europe and Central Asia, it's 25% of the, the workforce. And what we're seeing is with globalization, we're seeing new structural patterns of employment and work emerging, and the informal economy is responding. And also, as you can see from this photograph of a, way, of a waste picker in Ahmedabad in India, the mobile phone is transforming the way that people are able to work. It's very varied. 
This is a photograph that I took in Kibera, which is one of the largest informal settlements in, uh, in Nairobi. It has between 800,000 and a million people, depending on who you talk to. If you need to know the latest results from Man United, from Chelsea or from Arsenal, you come to the Kibera Cinemax. It's very hidden, and you can see here a home worker making cigarettes on the left in Ahmedabad in India. But if you happen to want a hand-sewn football, then the center for this is in Silicot in, in Pakistan, which provides over 80% of world production, many by home-based workers. It's innovative. Another photograph from Nairobi. If the central Nairobi hotels are too expensive, come to the Al Nusra Hotel in Matare. It's also responsive, another photograph from Kenya. And you can see that construction and is, a, of course, a key part of urbanization, but much of this happens informally. What we're also beginning to understand is that within the informal sector, it's not only globalized, but, but specialized. And this is a photograph of Varavi in Mumbai. Again, a large settlement of perhaps a million people but a major center of waste recycling. And you can see how these goods are sorted and stored on the roofs of houses. So there are a myriad of small businesses which together are uh, undertaking a very specialized part of this waste recycling business, which is important throughout the whole urban um, system of Mumbai. It's also based on solidarity. This is a photograph by one of my PhD students, Reagan Doyle of a cooperative of women in the settlement, the informal settlement of Keiko in, in Dar es Salaam. And they have formed a cooperative of wood suppliers to supply the local furniture making business, which is found in the settlement, which is where many ministries buy their comfortable armchairs. It's transnational and we now understand that goods are traded between China and Africa and across the African continent, um, across Latin America and across borders. And here the lady in the bottom picture with the yellow background is a lady called Doris who comes from Ghana, she's buying goods in Togo. She crosses the border twice a week. She has a relationship with a local um, uh, border guard and she buys goods that have come without tax through the free port in Togo and sells them in Kumasi market in the center of Ghana. But the informal economy is often dismissed. These are photographs by another PhD student of mine, uh, Ademola Ramoyegan, that look at the destruction of the major market in um, Oshodi Junction in 2015. So we forget, we forget the interconnectedness and I think scholarship on the informal economy lags a little bit behind that on informal settlements, partly because it's difficult to estimate. People work around, they live in mobile livelihoods, in seasonal work and circular migration. But there is emerging scholarship. WeGo has done a lot of work on advocacy and collective bargaining. I've done work on networks and social capital. We've looked at the legal aspects of informality in terms of the right to the city and rights to public space. And macroeconomic studies have looked at the percentage of GDP that is informal, but I think this misses the vulnerability of people working informally. And there have also been sector studies, but those miss the issues of value chains. And the focus also has been on more stable countries, which are easier to research. Some sectors have had wide coverage, but others not. There is some study on linkages on the China-Africa trade or the very important study on cross-border um, trade in sub-Saharan Africa, Southern Africa by Kebedi and Krash, work also by the Nordic Africa Institute. And I think we also have to remember COVID-9, which leads to loss of markets. Um, informal workers have been forced to return to their villages. People work with, that, with little protection, although there have been some slim opportunities, for example, making masks in Argentina. But crucially, there have been very few studies on the informal economy over time, particularly over catastrophic events such as disasters or conflict. 
So I'm going to look at the, how the informal economy responds to urban crisis and particularly its impact on those working informally who stayed and survived during those crises. By 2030, 46% of the world's poor will live in fragile or conflict affected areas. And the findings here that I'm going to talk of is drawn from a four year comparative study funded by, by the UK's aid agency GIFID of crisis affected cities. And we looked at five cities in Hargeza, Kathmandu, Karachi, Cali in Latin America, and Dohuk in Kurdistan. Our thesis was that in fragile or conflict affected cities, the informal economy is has a pivotal role for livelihoods, services and economic recovery. And we wanted to know how the informal economy survived, how people were surviving, managing and thriving. And the, the cities were selected because they each had a key transition against which we could measure the before or after, although they're very different in scale and in the types of impact. So we identified from literature reviews and from other research five drivers of urban conflict. Uh, economic drivers, which was um, the aim for profit and uh, often led by fights over drugs, by gang trade and intimidation, by extortion and militarization of informal groups. There were political reasons which resulted from infighting among political parties or weak or corrupt local governments. Ethnic and cultural divides played a place, uh, including violent control over land, legal and illegal landmarking, and that it also in quasi-democratic societies enabled you to control the voting patterns of the people who lived in those areas. Territorial conf uh, conflict led to spatial control over certain districts or markets, particularly the amount of money that exchanges hands in urban markets is considerable. And we also have looked at displacement, which is the indirect impact of violence or civil war, the displacement of, of refugees or IDPs, internally displaced people. And I'm just going to give you a, a snapshot from those five cities and the, uh, the types of impacts that they faced and the, the, the results of, of our studies. Kathmandu was uh, uh, affected by a mass insurgency which started in 1996 and took, predominantly, took place predominantly in the rural areas. And it was really a revolt against dispossession and lack of voice in government. But in Kathmandu itself, it resulted in a rapid increase in IDPs, internally displaced people, people fleeing from the countryside. In between our bidding for funding and actually being able to do the research, it was also affected by the 2015 earthquake. And we looked particularly at the key transition, which was the 2006 Comprehensive Peace Award and the disbanding of the, the rebel army. So there were issues of child soldiers who were having to come back with missed education, having to come back into civilian life. This lady lives in an area called Tapitali, which is beside the Bagmati River. It's a floodplain. And the people here, the 300 or so families, moved from the countryside during the conflict. So they moved quite early on. When the Maoist government came to power, they were actually displaced, but they came back again. But I think the wonderful story that they, they told us was of solidarity. When the local earthquake hit, the nearby maternity hospital was badly sheltered and badly affected. So these people sheltered many of the pregnant ladies who'd had to flee the hospital in their makeshift homes. And I think that shows there were many other, uh, how important solidarity is. And, and there were many other examples of that in Kathmandu. Karachi was complicated. This is a photograph of Liari, which is a settlement of perhaps a million people. It's quite close to the port. It's supplied port workers. But Karachi has been the gateway for the Soviet-Afghan wars and for imports into Afghanistan. So it's become a big center of both drug smuggling and arms struggling. You can see in this photograph on the right hand side, 
there are pictures of bullet holes in, in the building. And by 2000, uh, from about 2007 to 2012, over 7,000 people had died in Karachi as a result of urban violence. The key transition that we looked at was the Rangers operation, which was a top-down paramilitary force uh, introduced by the government as a result of a court ruling to try to reduce the, the violence in Karachi. One of the problems of the violence is that it had destroyed the formal economy, principally textile making, and so that many people had been retrenched and had to move into informal employment. And as a result of this top-down initiative, while peace was restored and people were able to get on with their lives, we found perhaps a bit less of the solidarity and collective working that we saw in other places. Hargeza was particularly interested. The capital of Somaliland with a population of about 5 million people. It was flattened by bombing as a result of the Somali civil war in 1988. And in 1991, it seceded from Somalia, though it's not internationally recognized. It has nevertheless been run since as a democratic state with changes of power at election, uh, elections both the national government and local government level. And although it was a while ago, we looked at the key transition of the Declaration of Independence. Interestingly, peace in Somaliland was restored very much as a result of women's initiatives and enterprises. Women were key in negotiating the peace, which was driven by, led by local elders, and they refused help from the international agencies. But women married across clans and could bring factional group together. It was also led by trust with an informal system of banking and money supply which came across the border from Djibouti. And this is even today a money, money changer in the middle of Hargeza and certainly in Cardiff. You wouldn't tie up bags of money in a string bag and leave it in the middle of the street. But there were also pernicious uh, Im implications. And as a result of the vacuum in governance in Hargeza, one of the informal industries which survived was the cat economy or chat. Uh, cat is a narcotic drug and many people, particularly men, but also women, chew it in the afternoon. And that undermines their, their productivity. It's imported from Ethiopia and the lorries come in blaring their horns to get people to buy but leave creeping away with our dollars, as some, one person told us. In Dahuk, the population of Dahuk government is about 1.4 million. And at the height of the, um, the Syrian and Iraqi civil war in 2012 to 2014, they had up to 700,000 refugees and internally displaced people. So the population had increased by almost 50% overnight. While many people have now gone home, there are still large refugee and IDP camps. But what the refugees did is they brought new skills into the economy, skills of furniture making particularly, and tourism. Dohuk is an important tourist center. But Cali, we found particularly interesting. So Cali is the third city of Colombia. It's in the region of the Val de Cauca. And for many, um, many decades, it's been the center of, of drug trafficking, drug growing, and has been ruled by various large gangs, drug gangs, and been subject to armed conflict. In the mid-1990s, it had one of the highest homicide rates in the world, with 308, uh, 380 people a year killed, um, 380 people per year per 100,000 people killed in armed conflict. There was a massive fight against drug gangs um, in the 1990s, which took out some of the leaders of the main drug cartels. But by, 2000, um, by the mid 2000s, the middle ranking dealers and operators really were still at large. And as the export markets had closed, they found a new market in the local community. So there were lots of problems of local drug supply, of extortion, etc. But the peace agreement in 2015 and 2016 was. Um, 
uh, was the turning point that we looked at. But particularly Cali was extraordinary and it was partly because of local government uh, innovation. They had a leading mayor, Rodrigo Guerrero, who is an epidemiologist from trained in Harvard University. And he applied the techniques of his profession to understand, to collecting data. He got cross-agency people together every Tuesday morning and they shared data to understand really where the drug, drug um, where the homicides were, were occurring, where the trafficking was occurring. And they found that it wasn't just locally spread across, but it was, it was connected to payday, it was connected to certain uh, local elements. And as a result of targeted police intervention at certain times of the month, they were able to reduce the homicide rate right down to 25 per 100,000 people per, per year. But this is really interesting. This is the, um, the Metro Cali private sector company, which runs the new Mio Mio bus company. And, and technical staff in the, in the Metro Cali organizations had observed that the street vendors on the old buses, which were being replaced by this smart new rapid transit, were being displaced and they argued with their bosses that they could be given a job, they could be given an ID card and they designed special coats for them as you can see in the right, on the right hand side with large pockets for the street vendors to put their goods in. And so effectively this was a formalization of the informal economy led by private sector but working in partnership with local government, a very innovative project. And we hear, see here some examples of replacement economies that took place. Transport, the motorcycle taxis uh, on the left in, in Cali. We can see the water supplies, uh, which took place covering half of Hargeza. Uh, waste picking and waste collection and sorting. The bottom photograph is a house in Cali. And obviously food supplies in Kathmandu. So people survive during conflict and what we need to do is to understand how that survival mechanism takes place. So we identified five common cycles in post-conflict informal economies. There was the survival livelihood economy which survived the, the, the disruption and continued partly uh, more or less as before. There was the re replacement economy, as the previous slide showed you, supplying basic services, food and water, um, solidarity, barter and trade, the refugee or camp economy, and also the war economy, like the chat economy I've talked about. And our core findings were that in urban crisis, people construct livelihoods and enterprise for survival. They foster these initiatives, which helps build stability and economic recovery and this forms this essential bridge between emergency short-term measures and long-term development. And we've adapted a diagram from UNDP which looks at how the humanitarian and development agencies work together and where we can help bridge this divide. So along the top, if you look at these three periods, the immediate post-conflict period, the stabilization period and the development period, and three streams of activity, that activity A, which is the immediate relief, the conflict relief needs to do no harm, to understand and enable existing livelihoods, because we often move in and don't fully understand what's already happening in front of our eyes, and look at the potential for support services. During the process of stabilization, organizing workers, recognizing solidarity economies and addressing those pernicious war economies is the critical thing. And in track C in development, strengthening work, worker organizations, strengthening local government capacity and developing local, uh, local economic development initiatives become important. So if we look now briefly at those who have been displaced, at both IDPs and refugees, I'm going to just give some general findings from our studies and then also talk about research in Addis Ababa. So the numbers are large. There are 71 million forcibly displaced people in the world, estimated by UNHCR by the end of 2018. And that includes nearly 30 million refugees and asylum seekers and 45 million 
conflict affected IDPs. This displacement is part of a global movement of people that includes economic migrants. It's sometimes protracted and, and refugee crises often last for up to 10 years. We now know that 60% of refugees live in towns and cities, rather than the traditional view of refugees being hosted in camps. And while refugees, often without the right to work, move into the informal economy, and they have needs similar both to informal workers and to economic migrants, some needs are distinct. There are also issues of displacement economy, uh, and the looking at the, and we have defined in our research displacement economies as the collective economy created by the enterprise of refugees and IDPs through livelihoods, enterprises, and their need for services and consumption, and the, um, through refugee support and diaspora inputs from governments and international agencies. However, refugees, urban refugees are particularly vulnerable. Although they have opportunities, they also face discrimination. There is a humanitarian focus on cities, but that's on local integration and self-reliance. And it's argued that humanitarian livelihoods interventions are insufficient. Post governments may limit formal employment, and there are difficulties of finding refugees in an urban setting and distinguish them from the urban poor in host communities. So we looked at several literatures on urban informal economies, urban refugees, um, humanitarian and, uh, and development interventions, and also in urban development planning. And particularly, we looked at the challenge, which is that it's a hidden problem beyond aid and policy concerns with a huge variety in rights and adaptation skills. <coughs> Excuse me, not a COVID cough. Um, I just need to, to take a drink if that's okay. But I think from our research, we, uh, we have concluded that the right to work is key and there are very many different ways in which this is dealt with. Um, there's the right to work in action where it's uh, in legislation. If you look at the green box on the right hand side, the legal status is across the top. The, um, uh, the practice, the de facto practice is down the side. So, for example, in countries such as Ecuador, Uganda and Egypt, there is a right to work in law and this sort of works in practice. In Ethiopia at the moment, there is no right to work for most of the population, but that is changing uh, in legislation. But in practice, people are allowed to work and there are other countries where there's no right to work and restricted practice. So let's look at our findings on refugee economies in Addis Ababa. Ethiopia has a population of 100 million, it has a very large young population, and its refugee population has, has varied between about 750,000, 650,000 to about eight or 900,000. It has some, some rather challenging neighbors and it has the second largest refugee population in Africa, but in particular, Ethiopia has been a, a, a very good example of good practice. It's had an open door policy to hosting refugees, mainly in camps. Uh, but the, one of the problems is that many of the refugees who arrive see Ethiopia not as their eventual home or as a destination for going back, but as a route to se uh, secondary migration, the Libya route as many of them called, getting to Libya and crossing from North Africa to Europe. So Ethiopia was a pilot program in the 2016 Obama summit, which was a United Nations summit chaired by President Obama. And the outcome was the comprehensive refugee response framework. And Ethiopia has made considerable progress. It has a draft national refugee response strategy a government declarate proclamation in 2019. But the work has been overshadowed by internal conflict and the country at certain stages in 2018-19 
was also uh, dealing with nearly 3 million internally displaced people as a result of ethnic conflict and is now battling with COVID-19. So this is a map of Ethiopia and you can see that most of it comes from UNHCR and you can see that many of the, uh, the refugees are hosted in camps and those are quite near the borders of the places where they cross. So two areas in the north, in Shire and Afar, in Gambela near South Sudan in the west, in Melkadida and Jijiga near Somalia in the east. In Addis Ababa, the population of refugees is relatively small, registered refugees, although we think there are a lot more without registration. And there are about 30,000 people and the majority of those are Eritreans who have specific, specific dispensation to move to Addis Ababa and quite a lot of Somali nationals. But refugees come from over 20 countries, including Sudan, South Sudan, um, Yemen, the Great Lakes area, Congo, etc. They're often living in protracted displacement. They have ethnic, linguistic and familial ties both with the border communities who often speak the same language and they are in practice permitted to work to a certain degree so long as they don't get in, in um, problems with the law. Although this is changing as a result of the pledges that Ethiopia made as a result of the CRRF. This is a, um, a photograph of Bole Michele uh, where the Sudanese population congregate and a, a, the, sorry, the Somali population congregate and they've been credited with introducing perfume into the Addis Ababa market. That perfume is traded across the border from Somalia. Whence it originates, I, I don't know. But it's also a great center for new clothes, for, for clothes which suit Muslim uh, households, and also for secondhand clothes. This is an area called, uh, called Gofa, where many, many of the Eritreans live. And the pool bar is run with an Ethiopian license in partnership between an Ethiopian and Eritrean refugee. And I didn't know until we went to Addis that pool bars were quite an important employment center for refugees. So we found a number of income and economic contributions. So the income of refugees comes from four main sources, from humanitarian assistance, although there's not much of that in the urban area, from remittances, but particularly informal entrepreneurship and also informal employment. And refugees worked in running their own businesses, in street trading and setting up restaurants. They worked with Ethiopians to bridge the language divide. They also worked as employees in Ethiopian businesses to bring in refugee custom. But they worked a lot in a lot of other uh, uh, sectors. For example, nurses or translators, nurses in private clinics or translators. And we even found somebody who was a pacer for running marathons because Addis Ababa is of course high and it's a very good place to train if you're a marathon runner. They made positive economic contributions and for example there were certain sectors where we found business agglomerations. Through bridging the language divide they enhanced existing enterprises. They provided reciprocal local employment um, crossing that, that host refugee divide they created new markets for the refugee community, trading in new products, and they also engaged in trans-border trade. And Ethiopia is now extending both the right to travel to Addis Ababa and the rights of people to work, but is going to have to cope with an increase of displacement and displacement economies as a result of that. So, in conclusion, uh, urban refugee economies are under-researched. The informal economy is the economy in many southern cities. Conflict affects vast numbers of people in these cities, either directly or indirectly. And it's this nexus of conflict and the informal economy which is key. Our researchers started to look at the informal economy and conflict and crisis-affected cities, and we know that it changes but there is more to be done. And while the role of refugee economies is ca in camps is 
reasonably well researched. Much less is known about the interconnections, the survival strategies, the managing strategies of refugee and displacement economies in cities. And we need to bridge the gap between, um, bridge the gaps in knowledge and also look at the challenges of co-production of economic recovery and those challenges are Im immense. So we need to bridge the gap between humanitarian, short-term humanitarian assistance and development to develop a localized understanding of the informal economy and conflict to set in affected cities and refugee economies in host cities. So that interventions by aid organizations and by governments at least at minimum do no harm and support and enable that process. We need a global shift in refugee policy that strengthens the right to work, but also strengthens the right to open a business, something which the Addis refugees told us that they didn't have, and also changes local, local attitudes towards their own informal economies. But there is potential, the potential for co-production is significant, but we need to observe and we need to understand. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm very much looking forward to the questions and the discussion as a result of, of this presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Wow. Thank you, Alison, for that uh, empirically rich presentation. And I can see that we have some questions in the Q&A box now. So the first question is from uh, Anuband Hambarde. Alison, the research you presented is uh, very insightful. I am quite keen to develop a pedagogical method to teach design of informal spaces to masters in urban design students. How much of this research is available with open access and where it can be accessed? Have you done any work towards pedagogical application of this research? Do you, read it, do you want me to answer one by one or should we take a couple of questions all together, do you think? Yeah, I think there's also a follow-up question from him. So let me just read it out. And yeah. then the follow-up question is also from Anuban. Through your research, have you found any correlation between informality and urban forms? And if so, how you see the effects of urban forms on informality? We can probably address that and then take in the yeah. other question. So, so thank you, Anaband. I don't, I don't know where you're teaching, but there's lots of material that's, that's open access. I think you, you want to go to the Informal Urbanism Hub in Melbourne. Um, there's, there's some material on our Informal Economy Research uh, uh, Observatory website. But I would also direct you to the work of WeGo, Women in Informal uh, uh, in informal employment or uh, organize, we go globalizing and organizing. And there's, there's a lot of material there. It, much of it is done by, by academic researchers, but also in partnership with, with, um, with workers themselves. And uh, we learn a lot through master's dissertations and, and also through talking to people locally. So it would be very exciting to perhaps bring street vendors in to talk to some of your students if that's possible due to COVID research. And there are certainly um, correlations between informality and urban forms. I have a, <coughs> a student, Jimli Alfarabi, who teaches at Gadamada University in Dr. Carter, and he's just looking at the role of streets in informal settlements. And he's found how both the shape and the creation of those, those streets is shaped by, by community and cultural practice and how those streets are also managed. So that's, there are really exciting examples to find through this. Okay, so we have uh, several more questions. Uh, some of them are related. So next question is from Lutfun Nahar Lata. How could we strengthen uh, refugee informal workers' right to work using public spaces? Then, uh, yeah. Continue. Yeah, the other one is uh, about co-production from Smitha Budarafu. 
thank you. Could you explain what is co-production in this research? And uh, there's also a related question about co-production from Loretta Belliato. Thank you for your very insightful research presentation. I am keen to more about your approach to co-production. I think in a way I can answer those three questions through, through one lens. And the key is work of organization uh, because workers often um, always know their local context the best. And there are often measures that local governments and um, local, local governments have, uh, uh, have ignored or there are perhaps pernicious regulations that are historic that, uh, that provide a barrier to being able to develop in informal work. And I think the second element of stre strengthening both refugees and informal workers' rights to using public places um, is partnerships with local governments. So, so local governments often don't need to, uh, don't, don't understand how to deal with their informal economies. I'm an urban planner and one of the things is that you can't mark, mark street traders on the map very easily because they move around. You can mark concentrations of street maps, you can draw lines around the edges of markets, but that actually doesn't deal with the reality. And so that's why the research that we did in Cali, Colombia was so exciting because there were, there were, many, um, there were many other initiatives. So my, my academic co collaborator, Dina Martinez, who works at the Universidad de Ceci, has been very influential in working with local green government. She did a project trying to identify and help organize the uh, waste recyclers in the town. She's worked with local government on mapping the informal economy. So it's knowledge and understanding, partnership and organization. In terms of co-production, I think that the uh, we, we we worked with informal economy organizations wherever we could and um, our approach to co-production is really I think based on on this partnership. It's sometimes very difficult to work locally uh, to change local government practice because there are many political pressures and so one of the approaches that, that we have undertaken is to work very closely with international organizations that promote good practice. So working with UN Habitat particularly, and I've done a number of joint publications with, with them, which have been published on their website from time to time. And so that good practice is disseminated down and also to work with organizations that work through and with local government. So particularly organizations such as the Commonwealth Local Government Forum that's been very supportive in some, some of their activities. So co-production on the ground can be sensitive, it can be political, and, and sometimes it can threaten people's livelihoods. And we have to be very careful mm. and follow very close ethical procedures in the work that we do. But wherever possible, we work with the local, local worker organizations but all, and also local government associations locally, but also through international agencies. Yeah. We also have a question from Kim, do we? In what ways does a high level of informality leave communities vulnerable to conflict and crisis? And it, in what ways can informality be a form of resilience? Um, I was looking at the question box and not, not the chat box. I think particularly uh, um, what we found Informality leaves community vulnerable because it often um, uh, it, it often well conflict leads community vulnerable because often it leads to a breakdown of governance. For example, in Liari in Karachi, there was a period where there was a long period of no go where local uh, local authority officials and the police simply couldn't enter the area because of the gang violence. And that leaves um, local operators subject to extortion. We found rather a, 
a sad number of, of cases of that. And informality, but informality is a form of resilience. And so what we found was that sometimes informal groups of workers gathered together to provide informal security. So they might together, <coughs> so they might uh, together uh, provide a guard overnight for, for a street market or a market store, for example. And that, that it's actually, it's the worker organization that provides both the basis for negotiation and also for as, as, a, as a form of, of resilience. Thank you. And I think there are another couple of questions. In yeah, the question there answer. are two more questions. So one is from Hathai. You mentioned the role of mobile phone, internet and social media to informal economy. Could you please give some more insights about this? how internet and communication technologies have influenced the informal economy. Thank you so much. There's a, there's a wonderful example of that from, from Kenya. There's a, there's a couple of examples. And of course, Kenya is leading the world in M-Pesa, which is mobile money. And I understand that even in some secondhand clothes markets, you can go and buy secondhand clothes, which are uh, which were initially bought in the UK or Australia, the, the, the street traders are, are very um, discerning about German clothes or UK clothes or American clothes or Australian clothes. And of course, local tailors have to adjust the sizes because some of our clothes are too big for the local market. Um, but you can pay for your, your secondhand clothes through M-Pesa. Um, but we came across a number of... Uh, um, uh, and uh, a number of examples, a really interesting example, which was discovered by Linda and Gobi, one of my MSc students, who looked at the, um, uh, at the sale of cut flowers. So Kenya is a, is a big grower of cut, cut flowers for the European market. They get flown to Amsterdam, uh, but those that are not, uh, not sold are perhaps not quite good enough quality for or uh, are, are sold to the local market. They're often sold by street vendors at the, the side of the road. Those street vendors develop a local market and you can order those by mobile phone. You can, uh, you, you can uh, the street vendors use the mobile phone for internet to research bouquets of flowers so that they can sell them for weddings and flower arrangements for offices, etc. And they even sometimes order flowers from Uganda when they're not in season in Kenya to be able to supply the local market. So the mobile phone is completely changing the way they work. Oh, and they order them from the airport. So the middleman at the airport will ring up and say, I have a load of lilies, do you want them? And the street paid vendor will pay a deposit half by M-Pesa and then they'll order transport through their mo mobile phone and then the rest will be paid on, on arrival. And that's replicated in a number of cases, although that was perhaps the most exciting case that we, we came across. We also have a question from uh, Manas Murthy. Thank you for the comprehensive overview. While it is a widely accept, while it is widely accepted that informal tactics are survival strategies developed by the urban poor or marginalized sections, have you come across informal counter tactics employed by state in governance? Also, hello from a former Cardiff MA urban student. So. <laughs> it's great to meet you again, man. That's really nice, and I think that's a great question as well. Um, and yes, of course, there are always informal tactics. I think probably the most, uh, well, the most prevalent one is just ignoring what's going on. If it's not causing too much problem, you can leave it alone. The problem with that is that it gives informal workers no security. And so the, um, uh, uh, that, that can be a change in government. Uh, perhaps a new politician coming to power, wanting to cleanse the streets. But I think what we're beginning to understand, and this is, I mean, it stretches right back to the, the work of Jane Jacobs in, in the United States, is that messy streets and messy urban, uh, urbanism is interesting urbanism. And that, that we need to be able to think, not in, in kind of train tracks, to be able to look at single-use streets, 
single-use residential areas and at single-use settlements. Um, but to, to think about how, how, how we can work both, both informally to increase knowledge, but also um, translate that into much more security for this, this vibrant and energetic sector of local economies. So often informal practices are the starting point for something which can in lead to improved conditions. But essentially, you do in the end need legislative change, which provides security, and that can be access to social security, so access to health cards. We go, for instance, had a very interesting initiative with the head headquarters in Ghana, in the markets of Accra, whereby they, they gained a health card for them, so that many of those were rural to urban migrants and they didn't have access to health services. And so they enabled them to register for health services, even though they don't have a formal address. So that's often something which is a barrier to registration, both for social security and to registering a business, not having a formal address. So finding innovative ways around that is really important. I think we can have a last question from uh, Eric Gazy. Thanks, Alison, for the very insightful presentation. You noted how social capital is instrumental for the informal economy and settlements. In your experience, to what extent does government-backed evictions and displacements disrupt the social capital? And how does social capital help in managing the effect of these displacements? <sighs> evictions are, are awful. We've had global campaigns for years uh, against the evictions from informal settlements, but the evictions of workers can sometimes be almost as damaging and can disrupt livelihoods, and they vary. Uh, they, they happen frequently, and uh, social capital often isn't enough to be able to protect workers. And what happens after an eviction is that workers lose their livelihoods, their children don't eat, they can't go to school. You get the kind of cat and mouse evictions, which can be the police coming along and, and people clear for 20 minutes or so and then come back again. And sometimes those are facilitated by, a, 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 or the, the impact of those is reduced by a small payment to the police. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a profit and a lack of security. It means that people can't invest in their space that, that undermines the potential for growth and the potential for income for the informal economy. And longer term, governments do back evictions because they're often popular with, with the formal businesses, formal and businesses that have political influence. And, and it's possibly one of the, the most damaging aspects of the way that we're working at the moment. We saw how COVID-19 has also led to closure of markets, to closure of street spaces. And while governments have tried in many cases to provide support for informal workers, many of them have fallen outside these safety nets because they don't have registration or they don't have the relevant ID card. Social capital can help to a certain extent. So often relationships perhaps between shops and street vendors working outside can be reciprocal. The street vendors may sell goods for the shops, the shop may hide the street vendors goods while there's a, there's a raid going on. But it doesn't answer the need really for knowledge. And there, um, I, I used to be advisor to WeGo, I'm not working with them quite so closely at the moment. Uh, but there, the work of organizations such as, as WeGo are incredibly important in helping develop social capital, in helping develop knowledge, in enumerate, in enumerations, in providing data, so that we have an understanding of the, the way in which informal workers are operating and in the global connections, etc. But there's so much more to be done, and it will be wonderful to hear more about your research. You can find me at Alison, if you do a Google search of Alison Brown Cardiff, and I would love to hear more about your own research and your own work and where these step questions come from. And I should, if I may, Redden, if we're closing sure. now, say particular yeah. thanks to, 
the informality um, in, informal urbanism hub and the, this initiative and it's fantastic that 400 people have registered for this conference even if you can't all make the time change and i'm just looking as the dawn is breaking through my window yeah. and the sun is rising here <laughs> to to be able to wish you all good afternoon or good evening or good morning wherever you are <laughs> yeah so once again, Alison, thanks for your very insightful presentation and thanks everyone for all the questions. And before we close, just some announcement. Uh, our next webinar will be held on uh, November 6th and we will have Professor Gao Chamban from the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Gao Cham will give a keynote address titled Informality and the Pandemic, Thinking About Our Conceptual Vocabularies. Then next week, on October 18, we will have a panel session on public space where three researchers, again, from different parts of the globe will be presenting empirical findings from their own research projects. So for those who haven't registered for our next sessions, please do so through our website, infer.org. So once again, thank you, Alison, for your uh, really insightful keynote lecture. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you.